applications for bioweapons such as anthrax. He introduced the project at the January State of the Union address. On your screen, committee chairman Tom Davis of Virginia and ranking member to the left Henry Waxman. This is live coverage on C-SPAN 2. ...safety of the American people in the event of a bioterrorist attack. This proposal, first announced by the President in his 2003 State of the Union address, authorizes the government to conduct and support the development, acquisition, and distribution of vaccines, treatments, and other biomedical countermeasures to use during public health emergencies, including bioterrorist attacks. Over the past few decades, we've seen rapid progress in the development of treatments for many seriously, naturally occurring diseases. Pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies are highly capable of producing diagnostics and treatments to meet consumer demand. However, there's been little progress in treatments for deadly diseases like smallpox, anthrax, Ebola, and plague, which currently affect few, if any, Americans. The reality is that for these diseases, there's little manufacturer interest in developing necessary treatments since there's no significant market other than the government. Should the United States be attacked with these deadly pathogens, however, the need for vaccines, tests, and treatments would be great and it would be immediate. The administration's Project BioShield initiative is designed to ensure that the United States is prepared. The bill would stimulate companies to develop modern and effective vaccines, drugs, and devices to protect Americans in the event of a bioterrorist attack or other, or other public health emergency. The bill has three main components. First, it sets up a process to expedite research and development of biomedical countermeasures. As part of this process, the Secretary of Health and Human Services would have flexible acquisition authorities to quickly and effectively buy cutting-edge products and services to support research, development, and production of vaccines and treatments. Additional acquisition flexibilities are put at the Secretary's disposal for the creation of a stockpile of these critical countermeasures. The Secretary would also have streamlined authority to hire technical experts and consultants. Secondly, the Secretaries of Homeland Security and Health and Human Services would be required to work together to identify and evaluate bioterrorist threats and determine which countermeasures are needed to combat these threats. The bill would also create a permanent funding authority designed to spur the development of medicines and vaccines by the private sector. Third, during national emergencies, the bill would permit the government to make available new and promising treatments prior to approval by the Food and Drug Administration. A version of the Project BioShield Act is introduced by Senator Judd Grade and, uh, in the Senate and was reported out of the committee last month. I intend to introduce a House version in the near future. We have assembled an impressive group of witnesses who will help us better understand this bill. I am particularly interested in learning how Project BioShield would assist in addressing the current public health emergency created by the epidemic known as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS. More than 2,000 suspected cases of this mysterious disease have been reported in 17 nations, including the United States, with 78 fatalities. So far, there is no effective treatment or vaccine to combat this deadly syndrome. I thank all of our witnesses for appearing today. I look forward to their testimony. I would now yield to Mr. Waxman for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome the uh, distinguished members of the panel, this first panel and the sec subsequent panel as well. Uh, we're holding a hearing on a proposal by the administration, which uh, I think all of us would support in its intent. Uh, we want to accomplish what uh, this uh, proposal would seek to have us accomplish. But our responsibility as members of Congress is to scrutinize it carefully, to try to think about um, the unintended consequences, and to make sure that the, uh, the job is done right. Uh, the development of effective countermeasures to bioterrorism is certainly vital to our national security. And Project BioShield represents a proposal to encourage the development of these products. Uh, we all support uh, trying to, uh, to do that. But we have a responsibility to look closely at the provisions of the legislation. And some of these provisions give me some uh, cause for concern. For example, uh, the proposal removes important protections against waste and abuse that are standard for government contracts. I understand the concern that these protections in an emergency situation could impede the development of necessary products. 
However, any exception should be made only when necessary and should be subject to review. Uh, this proposal would make it nearly impossible for the courts, for Congress, and even the executive branch to rein in abuses. The uh, provision eliminating the government's access rights to contractors' books and records is particularly troubling. Another provision permits uh, products to be distributed without FDA approval. Here again, I recognize there may be unusual circumstances that uh, would require this step in case of a dire emergency. However, the proposal's language is overly broad and could be used to support products that are simply not safe enough for FDA approval. This provision could also permit widespread distribution of unapproved drugs without informed consent, record, keating, record keeping, or reporting of adverse events. The BioShield proposal also provides for unlimited guaranteed spending for the procurement of vaccines and other countermeasures with little congressional guidance or limits on how much to spend. This is a, a blank check approach. It uh, could be looked at as an abdication of congressional responsibility. We should work to improve this proposal in such a, a way as to preserve oversight and recognize that in order for BioShield to work, we need to assure that commitments made will be honored. In this regard, it's ironic that the administration is, uh, does not uh, support a similar approach of assuring that commitments will be honored in the case of the smallpox uh, vaccine compensation program. Here, the argument for mandatory spending is strong because nurses, firefighters, and other first responders deserve to know that they and their families will be supported in the case of severe injury or death. Yet in the case of smallpox vaccination compensation, the administration has proposed limiting compensation to the amount uh, appropriated each year, explicitly refusing to guarantee its commitment to those Americans on the front lines of a bioterrorist attack. Uh, this inexplicable failure to assure funding is one of the reasons that the House voted down the administration's legislation on smallpox vaccination compensation last Monday. I raised this issue last week in the Commerce Committee to point out the inconsistencies. Uh, and at the time I did that, many people raised uh, the point, why should we allow automatic spending in this area? Uh, they uh, argued we shouldn't allow automatic spending in any area. But Secretary Thompson made the case last week that we want to assure that funding will be there so that the companies that are taking the financial risk of developing these products know that they will be able to count on those funds. I thought that was a, a, a strong argument to make, but equally strong is to make uh, the assurance clear that if a uh, uh, first responder gets immunized for smallpox, that they're going to be able to count on uh, funding should there be, uh, in, in rare circumstances, but nevertheless in some circumstances, an adverse event. Let me conclude by pointing out that the BioShield proposal includes provisions for public health emergencies, not just bioterrorism threats. The idea of including public health emergencies in a BioShield makes make sense because infectious diseases that occur in nature can claim many lives and can even become bioterrorist agents if intentionally spread. What justifies government intervention to support countermeasures is that the market fails to encourage their development on its own. This rationale also applies to the development of treatments for potential public health emergencies. In 2002, not a single new antimicrobial drug was approved by FDA, and apparently only a handful are in the development by major pharmaceutical companies. One reason may be that the market for the few cases of multi-drug resistant bacteria is currently quite small, and that leads to a market failure and, uh, and yet the need for such treatments is enormous. Just yesterday, the New England Journal of Medicine carried the first re report of a common bacteria that is extremely resistant to an antibiotic that is usually the last line of defense. If properly designed, then BioShield can serve valuable purposes, improving our preparedness against bioterrorist attacks and natural uh, epidemics. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses today to help us understand this proposal and find ways to improve it. We need to work together collaboratively for what is certainly a shared goal that we all have. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Gentleman Connecticut, the Vice Chairman of the Committee is uh, recognized.
Mr. Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening this very important hearing. I come to this discussion with significant skepticism, not about the urgency of the problem of countering biological threats, but about the adequacy and efficacy of the proposed solution. Buying biologics is not like buying bullets. The Cold War model of short-term research incentives and artificial markets as sustained defense contractors may not fit the intensely entrepreneur of pharmaceutical and biomedical industries. The Department of Defense, DOD, Joint Vaccine Acquisition Program and the Anthrax Vaccine Immunization Program should serve as cautionary tales. The latter rushed to procure last century technology to the detriment of research and development of a modern anthrax vaccine. The former spent six years and more than 300 million, but has yet to finish a single vaccine. As the current outbreak of severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, attests, we remain hard pressed to maintain our defenses against nature's evolving arsenal of biological threats. Hasty acquisition of medical countermeasures available within five years, as proposed in BioShield, applies only a short-term bandage to a long-term illness. Massive caches of stockpiled vaccines, antibiotics, and drugs will protect no, no one if they cannot be administered quickly and safely. The missing element of the protective shield envisioned in this proposal is public health capacity. Surveillance systems, diagnostic tools, and trained medical personnel are prerequisites to any effective defense against natural and man-made biological outbreaks. I look forward, uh, Mr. Chairman, to discussing the BioShield proposal and biopreparedness priorities within our, with our witnesses this morning. This is truly a very important hearing and one in which we should pay close attention. Thank you very much. We now move to our first panel of witnesses. Uh, I don't want to thank our witnesses for appearing today. Uh, we have Dr. Anthony Fossey from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Dr. Mark McClellan, the Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. From the Department of Homeland Security, we have Michael Brown, who is uh, the Undersecretary for Emergency Preparedness and Response. Uh, and rounding out the first panel is Dr. Dale Klein, who is the Assistant to the Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense Programs. It's the policy of this committee that witnesses be sworn, so if you'd uh, stand with me and raise your right hand. Solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Fossey, we'll start with you and we'll move straight down the line. I know you have uh, some time constraints, but I think we'll be able to, to, to meet them. Thank you for being with us. Uh, it's, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss Project BioShield with you today. And as you know from the legislative language, the purpose of the Project BioShield is to accelerate the research, development, purchase, and availability of effective medical countermeasures against chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear terrorism and public health emergencies. Project BioShield, as you, Mr. Chairman, summarized so well, is a three-pronged program. It increases the authorities and flexibilities of the NIH to expedite research. It establishes a secure funding source to purchase countermeasures, and it establishes an FDA emergency use authorization. I'm going to very briefly discuss the first two components in the context of how they relate to the work at the NIH. And my HHS colleague, uh, Dr. Mark McClellan, uh, the FDA commissioner, will discuss both the procurement issues and how they relate in the context of the FDA's responsibilities. The NIH research system has served the country and the world extraordinarily well for many decades. The NIH employs traditional funding mechanisms that include grants, contracts, cooperative agreements, and other partnerships, as well as time-tested personnel functions, a system that has resulted in numerous major advances that have improved the health of the nation, including the development of interventions for a number of emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. However, the events of September the 11th, 2001, and the subsequent anthrax attacks have changed probably forever how the biomedical community is going to respond to emerging threats. We are now in a wartime mode and are compelled to modify the way we do business without compromising the elements that have made us so successful. With regard to the first component of Project BioShield, the legislation provides for a number of special authorities at NIH that will have the aggregate effect of ex expediting the research process. This is what we call the push towards the countermeasure development. Among these, BioShield provides for expedited peer review of grants and contracts 
and I emphasize without compromising the scientific, technical, and programmatic standards. It also streamlines procurement authority, bolsters authorities for acquisition and renovation of facilities, expedites personal services contracts, and provides flexibility with regard to personnel authority. We feel that these expanded authorities will considerably hasten the pathway from basic research concept up to and including effective countermeasure development. Let me switch gears quickly and speak briefly about the mandated appropriations authority for the procurement of countermeasures. We at NIH and our colleagues at DHHS have had numerous occasions to discuss the development of countermeasures with companies ranging from small biotech firms to big pharma. These are our industrial partners that are essential to bringing countermeasure development to fruition. Many of these firms are willing to help in the development of biodefense countermeasures, but the fact remains that they are businesses and are not nonprofit organizations, and they need a tangible incentive to get involved. Now, when it is evident that a given product has a potential to make a profit, few incentives are needed to engage industry. However, when you're dealing with a product for which there is no guarantee of a return, or for which the market is tenuous, these companies clearly need some assurances that there will ultimately be a return for their investment. Without such assurances, they will simply pursue the development of other products. When we meet with companies, we hear one of two things. First, they may already be involved in the early stages of development of biodefense countermeasures on their own initiative, and they're willing to take on a fair amount of risk, but they want some assurances, if they are actually successful, that there will be a market for their product. Many state, quite frankly, that they do not want to be vulnerable to the vicissitudes of the cyclical appropriations process, as sound as that is in so many arenas. The other scenario in which we are trying to engage reluctant companies to get involved, namely people who have many other things to do with their efforts and with their expertise. In this instance, we do as we are doing now. We push with discretionary research dollars. However, in our experience, that does not seem to be enough. With Project BioShield, we will further be able to tell these companies that they can partner with us such that if at their end they meet milestones and come up with a licensable countermeasure, they have our assurances that there will be money available to them for advanced procurement and ultimately purchase. These are examples of what we call the pull of the process. In summary, the accelerated development of effective countermeasures against terrorism require a new research paradigm and new ways to engage our industrial partners. Project BioShield will help us meet the challenges of bioterrorism effectively and expeditiously. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today about this important initiative to approve our homeland security, and I'd be happy to take questions after the others. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fauci. Uh, Dr. McClellan. Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Waxman, distinguished members and staff of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today to discuss the Project BioShield Act of 2003. As you know, FDA has been engaged with other government agencies and the private sector in an accelerated major new focus on helping to develop and make available better countermeasures for biological, chemical, radiological attacks as well as other types of attacks. This bill will significantly enhance those efforts and improve our ability to protect our citizens from these threats. In light of the heightened security risks facing our nation and our troops, we appreciate your timely consideration of finding better ways to acquire the countermeasures that we need. I'm pleased to tell you that in the last two months alone, we've approved safe and effective treatments for certain nerve gases and radiologic agents. We've enhanced our stockpiles of vaccines and treatments for smallpox and other possible agents of biowarfare. Working with uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, particularly NIH, as well as DOD and the Department of Homeland Security and private companies, we're taking further steps to determine as quickly as possible whether other available agents may be of benefit. Such products include drugs that may be active against smallpox and viral hemorrhagic fevers, new treatments for exposure to radiologic agents, as well as novel treatments for smallpox and anthrax vaccines and immunoglobulins to treat botulism or complications of smallpox vaccination. We're also working on some new diagnostic and treatment methods for the severe acute respiratory syndrome. FDA recognizes that early and ongoing consultation with 
product developers is essential to get rapid approval of safe and effective products. We focused intense efforts on the rapid turnaround of requests for information, review of study plans and data, development of plans for appropriate product uh, production and use where needed under streamlined investigational new drug procedures for agents of terror, for treating agents of terrorism. Our experience with the approval of a new product treatment for the effects of certain nerve gases, pyridostigmine, was approved under a new animal rule as a result of legislation last year. In this case, FDA worked closely with the sponsors of the application to define not only the criteria that would help in evaluating the drug's safety and effectiveness for this use, we also worked closely to develop appropriate animal models that ultimately helped us verify safety and efficacy. At the same time, we realize that we can't easily solve the problem of getting safe and effective countermeasures to the public with the existing financial incentives for developing them. Our close work with the developers of these new products, which now includes around 200 professional staff in our biologics program alone, has reminded us that proof of concept is still a very long way from large-scale production of effective countermeasures that pose acceptable safety risks. In some cases, we've done the work to demonstrate safety and effectiveness of certain products for counterterrorism use, but we don't yet have companies willing to produce these products. To bring badly needed, safer, and more effective countermeasures to our nation's defense, we're going to need to do more to encourage all parties, basic science researchers and government labs, as well as the major medical companies, to take up the cause of developing countermeasures. Consequently, while the countermeasures we've made available already have given us a deeper and more effective stockpile of treatments, in many cases they're based on old technologies. For example, monoclonal antibodies have changed the way that we treat everything from heart disease to cancer. It's considered a master technology in many biomedical circles. Many researchers believe that this technology can be effectively applied to developing countermeasures from anthrax and botulinum toxins to even the Ebola virus. Yet there's only limited research at the developmental stage into the application of these bioterrorism countermeasures. Instead, currently available antitoxin to botulism is based on a technology that was available when the FDA came into existence in 1906. This is a useful and very much needed treatment but there's strong reason to believe that new technology can produce antidotes and vaccines that are even safer and more effective and so much more valuable and that than what's available to us now. So I agree with Congressman Shays uh, about the need to get to a next generation of countermeasures through this approach. Research and development into next generation countermeasures has been much slower than for naturally occurring diseases, largely because there is no clear financial reward for success. Many companies that I've talked to, just like Tony has, know that the development of medical products is a very uncertain process, and they're used to taking risks and knowing they might fail. But what they want to know is that if they succeed, there's a certainty of a reasonable financial reward. Today, when it comes to countermeasures, there are plenty of risks, but few clear, defined rewards. And that's why Project BioShield is critically important. It includes new procurement authorities to provide certainty of payment in advance for the delivery of effective new products. By creating conditions for a market that's reasonably predictable and consistent over time, the government will set the stage for the private sector to make the investments and problem-solving efforts required to develop more effective next-generation countermeasures. Furthermore, in the event that a national emergency has been declared, the bill allows for a limited and highly targeted use of countermeasures for treating a select agent without the completion of the full FDA process. To be clear, this would only occur if a product in the approval pri pipeline is urgently needed because there are no effective approved treatments available. And if we conclude that in the emergency, the product's potential benefits outweigh its potential risks for those persons who don't have a better alternative. We expect more antidotes and vaccines to flow out of BioShield, and at FDA, we're ready to help facilitate their development and to make sure the best available treatments can be used effectively in an emergency. We live in a new biomedical era today. It's an era of great promise, but also of very serious risks in the years ahead from those who would deliberately use biological, chemical, radiologic, and other agents as weapons of mass destruction. In addition to the great need for translating biomedical research breakthroughs into effective new treatments for naturally occurring diseases like ca cancer and Alzheimer's, 
and antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections, we also need to create much-needed new incentives and authorities to respond to these unnatural threats. We're proud to be able to participate in this process to help the nation, and we appreciate the strong bipartisan effort in both the House and the Senate to respond to this urgent, critical challenge. Thank you, and after the panel's introductory statements, I'll be glad to take questions as well. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Shays, and Mr. Waxman. Uh, my name is Michael Brown. I'm the Undersecretary for Emergency Preparedness and Response Director of the Department of Homeland Security. I'm honored to appear uh, before you today on behalf of Secretary Ridge to discuss our role in bioterrorism preparedness in general and in BioShield specifically. Preparing our citizens for the event of a bioterrorism event is one, of the, is one of several significant challenges that the new department faces. But before I discuss the emergency preparedness and responses role in BioShield, I want to give you a broader perspective about our mission. Members of Congress have been very good to us in our years as an independent agency, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. But we are pleased to join the Department of Homeland Security and bring a wealth of knowledge from our experiences in preparing for, mitigating against, responding to, and recovering from disasters of all kinds. I want to assure the members of this committee that EPNR will not lose sight of its main responsibility of helping people and communities affected by disasters. The mission statement of the Directorate to lead the nation to prepare for, mitigate the effects of, respond to, and recover from major domestic disasters, both natural and man-made, including acts of terrorism, contains the same core responsibilities that guided the Federal Emergency Management Agency. During FY02, FEMA expended nearly $3.9 billion in disaster funds to aid people and communities who were overwhelmed by, by disasters, which included earthquakes, floods, ice and winter storms, fires, hurricanes, tornadoes, and tropical storms. FEMA has responded to 42 major disasters, including 37 states and, and four of the U.S. territories. I assure you that role will not change. It will only expand. And the Department is committed to helping our country and citizens in time of disaster. The risk associated with acts of terrorism pose a significant challenge for the Emergency Preparedness and Response Directorate. FEMA's rapid and decisive response to the events of September 11th demonstrated our role in consequence management. As a result, the nation is looking to the emergency management community to face this new challenge. Project BioShield was announced by the President in his January 28th State of the Union address. The doctors on the panel discussed many of the program's specific details, so I want to limit my comments to a few brief statements. Our director has, has the direct responsibility to do a couple of things. One, allow the federal government to purchase critically needed vaccines or medication for biodefense, $900 million in permanent indefinite authority in the president's FY04 budget. Two, ensure the adequacy of the nation's stockpiles of pharmaceutical, vaccine, and other medical supplies they can be delivered to emergency sites in 12 hours or less. $400 million were proposed in the President's FY04 budget for this. And third, to remove the barriers to the development and production processes. The Department of Homeland Security's role is to do three things. One, serve as the National Incident Manager, coordinating the preparedness and response to any incident that overwhelms or has the potential to overwhelm the resources of state and local government as declared by the President. We will also work with the Department of Health and Human Services to jointly determine that adequate countermeasures do not exist for a particular threat without the use of BioShield authorities. Third, along with the FDA, the Department of uh, Homeland Security must declare that chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear threat is real and requires the use of the BioShield provisions. For this intelligent assessment, we will be looking to the Information Analysis and Information Protectorate Directorate within the Department of Homeland Security. In short, Homeland Security will coordinate the Health and Human Services to trigger the use of BioShield, we will fund the program's activities, and we will make the product available through the Strategic National Stockpile. I am committed to working closely with the various component, components of the Department of Health and Human Services as they identify the contracting and procurement mechanisms within the pharmaceutical industry, as they work to certify the safety and efficacy of developing new medicines, and as they make recommendations for programmatic progress in areas of needed improvement. 
As the custodian of these significant federal dollars, the Department of Homeland Security is committed to working closely with Health and Human Services to make certain that BioShield authorities are triggered after its use is determined in the nation's best interest. Emergency preparedness and response has assumed the responsibility for several other biopreparedness activities, including developing a bioterrorism response plan called BioWatch, participating in the Metropolitan Washington Council of Government's Bioterrorism Task Force, and participating in major bioterrorism response exercises such as Top Off 2 and Exercise Silent Night. First, emer emergency preparedness and response has assumed the responsibility of maintaining and deploying the, st the strategic national stockpile together with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The strategic national stockpile is made up of pharmaceuticals, vaccines, and medical supplies housed in various areas around the country in cases of emergency. By dispersing these assets, the goal is to deliver the necessary supplies to a disaster site in 12 hours or less. BioWatch, which we have talked about, is also included in the, in the responsibilities of Homeland Security and is our effort to make sure that we are ahead of the game in case of emergencies. The Metropolitan Washington Council and Government's Bioterrorism Task Force is another area that we're working in, including the, the uh, exercises that we've done in Top Off and Silent Night. The National Disaster Medical System, I've already mentioned, is also a responsibility assumed by the Department of Homeland Security under the Act. This system assists state and local governments by providing primary care to disaster victims in the field, patient evacuation, disaster areas, definitive care when needed. Our, far, our federal partners include, include the Departments of Health and Human Services, Defense, and Veteran Affairs. While I have not limited my remarks to bio, by, to BioShield, I think it gives you a good overview of our responsibility in the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we're happy to work in this area and are pleased to answer any questions the committee ha may have at the close of these opening remarks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Klein? Chairman Davis, uh, distinguished members of the committee, I'm uh, pleased to uh, provide the opportunity to appear before you today. Uh, as indicated, uh, my name is Dale Klein, and I currently serve as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense Programs. Within the Department of Defense, I have the responsibilities for all matters concerning the formulation of policy and plans for nuclear, chemical, and biological defense programs. In this role, I'm responsible for the Department of Defense programs to develop and field biological countermeasures our warfighting forces needs. Due to the support of Congress and with the help of the resources you've made available to the department, our fighters that are now in the vicinity of Baghdad are much more prepared than they were in 1991 under Operation Desert Storm. The Department of Defense is very interested in the prompt approval of the administration's project BioShield initiative. New authorities are needed with appropriate safeguards to assure rapid and effective medical treatments can be introduced quickly to counter weapons of mass destruction. The President's Project BioShield initiative would enhance the Food and Drug Administration's ability to make needed medical products available in response to declaration of an emergency. DOD stands ready to assist civilian agencies in their efforts to provide modern, effective drugs and vaccines to protect against attack by biological, chemical, nuclear, or radiological weapons. The Department looks forward to working closely with Congress, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the Department of Homeland Security to collaborate as the lessons of the 2001 anthrax attacks are fresh in our minds. Currently, we were working with the Department of Health and Human Services and other federal agencies to develop the next generation anthrax vaccines for future use and several other programs. Mr. Chairman, in summary, I request that my full statement be placed in the record, and I want to reemphasize that the Department of Defense supports the President's Project BioShield initiative, and I'll be happy to answer questions you might have later. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, we're going to start the questions. I just have a quick question uh, before I yield to Mr. Waxman, and then we'll get a, another round. Um, Dr. Fauci, uh, next week this committee is going to be holding a hearing uh, on the severe acute respiratory syndrome or the SARS epidemic. Um, could you give us an update on what we now know about SARS, including how it's transmitted, how far it's spread, and what we can do to protect ourselves? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's a uh, SARS, standing for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, uh, has now spread through uh, several countries, uh, at least 17 countries. There are over 2,200 cases uh, and about 80 deaths. There has now been 100 cases in the United States in 27 uh, states. 
this is a new disease. It's what we refer to as an emerging uh, a, a, a microbe, an emerging infectious disease. The data from the CDC and from other laboratories indicate that the coronavirus, which is an interesting group, it's a very common virus. It's what causes about 10 to 20 percent of the common colds. There are two groups of coronaviruses. This is likely a member of a new third group. It has not been definitively demonstrated that this is the or the only cause of SARS, but the evidence is mounting every day from a variety of approaches that we're taking. It has the capability of being a very severe syndrome. The death rate in this is 3.5%, which may sound small, but when you think about the possibility of infecting hundreds of millions of people, this can turn out to be a major public health threat. In fact, in parts of the world, it already is leading to uh, such uh, draconian measures as quarantines and isolations in, in several countries. The CDC has done a magnificent job thus far, and, and we know they will continue to in not only identifying and tracking, but, I, but essentially now moving ahead in collaboration with the NIH and a variety of other agencies, the FDA, in developing diagnostics, therapeutics, and on our way to a vaccine. So in summary, Mr. Chairman, it's a serious threat. We must take it very seriously. We don't feel there's a need to panic at this point but we must continue to do the very stringent public health measures that we're approaching, as well as the research that's going into it. Well, thank you. That's just a synopsis. And we'll have a fuller hearing next right. week. We'll thank more questions, but thank yes, you sir. for that. Uh, let me uh, yield to our ranking member, Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Th that was very interesting, what you had to say about this uh, SARS. And uh, our committee is going to hold a hearing on it next week. I think it's important for us to understand what this a very looming threat uh, to public health and how best to deal with it. On this BioShield uh, proposal, the, the administration is suggesting that NIH conduct a research and development program for biological countermeasures. It then authorizes the procurement of countermeasures, but only after determinations by the Secretary of HHS and the, the Homeland Security and presidential approval. But Dr. Fauci, who makes the decisions about the research and development phase? We do, sir. Uh, and, and that's the, the point that I alluded to briefly in my opening remarks. There's the push and the pull. The NIH and other research agencies make a scientific decision about the kinds of, uh, of research that we need to do. We rely um, heavily, as others do, on intelligence reports, uh, particularly from the new Department of Homeland Security, about the threat assessment. But the fundamental basic research, that's our decision, and the way we execute this research is a scientific decision. Uh, you'll be t making decisions about uh, research into countermeasures for terrorism. At the same time, you oversee research against present threats to health. Yes, uh, should, should Congress be worried that traditional medical research will slow down as NIH focuses on biodefense? I don't believe so, Mr. Waxman. There's always uh, uh, a concern when you have to rev up and ratchet up uh, your uh, activities that there will be resources taken away from other areas. But if you look now thus far at the track record of the providing of resources for biodefense at the NIH, it has been quite extraordinary, and we appreciate not only the administration but the Congress and their bipartisan support of that. But if you look at the other areas of the emerging, naturally emerging and re-emerging diseases, that has not suffered and, in fact, has grown at a rate commensurate with the growth, the, the, the rather substantial growth of the rest of the NIH. So, in fact, we have not seen that. Uh, is there a potential for dual use? Uh, when, uh, with this research for biodefense may well lead us to research uh, breakthroughs for other diseases. Uh, I, I think it's not only a potential, Mr. Waxman, I think it is inevitable uh, that there will be an important uh, contribution to the research that we put into emerging and re-emerging diseases to inform us about biodefense research. And it is without a doubt that the research that goes into biodefense will help us with naturally occurring. Because as a matter of fact, as we've discussed before, as you know, uh, we feel that 
deliberately released microbes is just another form of emerging and re-emerging disease. Instead of occurring naturally, it's done with malice and deliberately, but the end result can be the same. And in some respects, nature itself can be our worst bioterrorist. So the resources and the manpower and the, and the uh, expertise that goes into one will naturally flow seamlessly back and forth into the other. Let me ask you about antibiotic resistance. Uh, this certainly poses a threat to public health now and a potential bioterrorist threat for the future, yet drug companies have few antibiotics in development, and some people believe there's a market failure for drugs to treat resistant bacteria. How urgent is the crisis in antibiotic resistance, and does it make sense for BioShield to cover research into new antibiotics to treat resistant bacteria? The answer to your question is that it is, a, it is a serious threat, and it has been a threat for some time. I think you alluded to, uh, uh, in your opening statement, the fact that, you know, as months go by, we, we're, we're pushing the envelope further and further about the emergence of resistance to microbes for which we have maybe one last firewall of an antibiotic against that. We are, we are recognizing this at the research level, and we are putting more resources into it, but I believe, and we all believe, that the basic research that we'll be doing on microbes for biodefense will directly and indirectly address the concerns that you have and the concerns that we have. For example, as part of our biodefense research endeavor, we are involved in a major program for the sequencing of pathogenic microbes, not only those that are on the category A or B list, but microbes for which one can, by a simple mutation, lead to a microbe that would be a, a bioterror weapon. So that kind of research that we had been doing before in emerging and re-emerging uh, disease research and that we've accelerated greatly with biodefense will address the question you're concerned about. Uh, as you know, um, our vaccine infrastructure is very fragile and uh, we always have to be concerned about the, the vaccines for uh, childhood uh, uh, diseases. Uh, do you, do you uh, see whether, uh, do you see any potential where the efforts to develop and produce bioterror vaccines could negatively impact childhood vaccine production capabilities? No, I don't think it would negatively do that at all. In fact, if we can, which I hope we do, that the long range effect would be to add a degree of robustness and vigor to the whole field of vaccinology, that there will be positive spin offs. You're quite correct. We're running a very we're walking a very thin line, notwithstanding biodefense, in the whole field of vaccinology because of so few companies that are involved for a variety of reasons. We feel that if we get both the basic research and the actual production flow of vaccines in general, that this will have positive spin-offs on vaccines for childhood diseases as well as adult non-biodefense vaccines. Thank you very much. Right. Dr. McClellan, the BioShield proposal would allow the Secretary of Health and Human Services to waive virtually all the consumer protections in the Federal Food and Drug Cosmetic Act in case of an emergency. Moreover, the proposal would then severely curtail judicial review of the Secretary's decision. What's the rationale for allowing uh, informed consent, record keeping, adverse event reporting, and other key uh, requirements to be waived? And what is the rationale for severely limiting oversight of these extraordinary powers? The rationale for the emergency use authorization is to provide the most effective, most potentially effective treatments to Americans in emergency situations. This is a limited authority program that only applies when the Secretary and others have determined that there is a national emergency because of a bioterrorism threat or another type of public health emergency. And it only involves agents where there are not effective approved treatments already available but where there may be treatments in the pipeline where the potential benefits outweigh the potential risks. We have a few now that are marching as quickly as possible towards approval and towards a full demonstration of safety and effectiveness, and that remains our goal. And I'd highlight that, that, is, that we're going to have even better incentives for that under the BioShield program. You don't get full payment for a development of a countermeasure under BioShield unless it's approved and licensed, fully licensed, fully shown to be safe and effective, by the FDA. 
That is a strong incentive for getting to the finish line that doesn't exist today and would move us out of the world we're in now where there are a lot of products that may be of use but no companies, as I talked about before, are willing to make the investments and come up with the good ideas needed to translate proof of concept into a truly effective treatment. And I understand that, and that's, that's an important part of why this bill is necessary, but in creating this balance, we let the Secretary waive all these consumer protections, and uh, it, it, it looks at, to me like this authority is quite broad to, awa uh, to waive uh, FDA approval standards. Will that give incentives um, that is needed to conduct the kinds of safety and efficacy trials that are needed, or, or are some of these companies going to figure they can get around that? Well, I agree we need more incentives to conduct the needed safety and effectiveness trials, and that's the main reason for the procurement authority for BioShield that only makes payment on delivery of an approved, a full payment for an approved product. The emergency use authorization does include a number of protections to make sure that in the limited circumstances of the emergency, we do as much as possible to limit distribution, limit who can administer, uh, require studies, pro require record keeping and uh, you, you, access to records. All of those are elements of the BioShield proposal and the Secretary would specifically design its use with our recommendations and those of others to do as much of all of those activities as possible. You're, you're, you're giving me assurances that the, we're not going to pay these companies unless they do what they're required to do, but I'm, I'm a little concerned about the broad authority to waive uh, some of the consumer protections like informed consent or making sure we know about the adverse events uh, and other, other aspects where, um, where right now the law is set up to not just make sure the company does what it needs to do to get paid, but that the consumers and adverse consequences to consumers are monitored and dealt with adequately. Right. We, we want to get to approved treatments as quickly as possible, but with these products in development, there may well be a number that have been shown to have potential benefits for conditions where there are no effective treatments approved, and under those circumstances, we think it's appropriate with all of these restrictions in place to do as much record keeping as possible, as much monitoring and, and standards for production as possible, as much mandatory reporting, reporting of adverse events and informing the consumer, uh, informing the public as possible about appropriate use as can be done under the circumstances. And I, I'd be happy to continue to work with your staff to make sure we tailor those, uh, that language appropriately. We think the bill does a pretty good job now of getting as much done as possible on informing consumers, on collecting adverse event data and the like. We think that's very important in the emergency use process. But it is an emergency and it is a very special limited use condition that requires some special considerations. Your, your answer is very useful. I, I have other questions but we'll pursue them on the subsequent Thank round. You. And I appreciate your offer to work with us to improve the bill. As the ranking member points out, we will have a second round. What we're doing is we're doing five minute uh, double, so we're doing a 10 minute questioning period. Uh, and I'll recognize myself. Uh, I'd like to ask each of you, what is your assessment of the seriousness of the threat we face with bioterrorism? We'll just start with you, Dr. Fauci. I think the threat is serious. Um, the, the risk of it happening is something that we can't quantify. But if one looks at the history of what has gone on, the production of weapons of bioterrorism decades ago that we have no real assurance of their full accountability, for example, by the Soviet Union, the recognition of weapons of bioterror that were clearly recovered in the first Gulf War. And right now, obviously, we need to see what happens in the current engagements. And the fact that we have already been hit uh, in the fall of 2001 and the potential for this has us feel strongly that we need to err very strongly on the side of preparedness. So it's difficult to, to quantitate a risk, but we're concerned. Dr. McCullen? Uh, I, I agree with that assessment. There is a real reason for concern. In addition to the um, specific risk that Dr. Fauci has outlined, like to highlight that as part of our preparedness efforts, we've also undertaken a number of threat assessments. And at FDA, we've got responsibility for the security of most of the food supply. As Secretary Thompson has said, he is very concerned about the real risk of a bioterrorist or other type of terrorist event 
involving foods. I'd like to highlight that it's not only bioterrorism that we're concerned about here. Recently discovered terrorist cells in Europe that were attempting to manufacture ricin. And pri pre previous episodes of cyanide poisoning highlight that, that various chemical agents also pose a real risk to the health of the public. Mr. Brown? I, I want to emphasize what Dr. McClellan just said. The threat is real. But I want to add a, a different dimension to it. Uh, even if terrorists are not successful in launching a wide-scale biological attack or a chemical attack, they will launch a small-scale attack just for the effect, that, for the terror effect alone. So that even if they don't inf infect a wide, broad spectrum of society, if they can put the fear in the American public that they have this capability by launching a small attack somewhere, they will do that. M Mr. Thank Chairman, it is real. Dr. Klein? Mr. Chairman, I would also like to acknowledge that the, the uh, threat is real and serious. I think uh, the events of 9-11 demonstrated that. The anthrax attacks also demonstrated that. Uh, the Department of Defense has a fairly significant uh, monitoring program. And I think on the biological threat side, one of the reasons that that is uh, a concern is the capital investment to produce those materials are less than uh, it would cost to develop, for example, a nuclear weapon. So uh, bio uh, threats are real. Great. I'm going to work backwards. Dr. Klein, uh, the answer will go the other way. What do you think the future of bioweapons will be? Should we focus mostly on natural pathogens or enhanced pathogens? And what enhancements to these pathogens should concern us most? Mr. Chairman, I think when we look at uh, what specific threats that we look at, we have a process both at the Department of Defense and with our interagency colleagues to define what those threats are. So we have a process to uh, evaluate those specific threats. What we look at at the Department of Defense for our men and women in uniform, uh, we look at not only what is it uh, that might be available, but what, what can be weaponized. I think uh, my colleagues at the Department of Homeland Security and uh, Department of Health and Human Services uh, have other areas where the terrorist threats would be different. So I think what we need to do uh, collectively, and I think BioShield addresses this, is that we need to work collectively as an interagency to define those threats. Just quickly, the other part of the question, though, is it the natural pathogen or the enhanced pathogens? In other words, the altered um, biological agent. In my opinion, in the near term, it'll be the, the natural ones that have been modified for a weapon, uh, and then we will look at the uh, modified ones. Mr. Brown, thank you. Based on the intelligence I've been receiving and, and looking at, I think it's the natural pathogens, those that they can use quickly and easily. Dr. McCon? Uh, we rely on the Department of Homeland Security and others for these for help with these threat assessments, so I defer to them. Uh, I do think we need to be prepared for both types of agents, both naturally occurring and modified ones. Some of the technologies that we've outlined that, that we think would result from a BioShield initiative, such as monoclonal antibody techniques and better techniques for producing <laughs> vaccines quickly will support our ability to deal with modified pathogens as well as the naturally occurring ones. So the approach that we're outlining here would provide a useful strategy for addressing both. I would like to emphasize again, though, that the only threats out there are not bioweapon uh, agents, also chemical agents and radiologic and nuclear agents are real threats, too. Thank you. Dr. Fauci? Uh, I agree with my co-panelists' uh, uh, statements. We also rely heavily on the Department of Homeland Security for threat assessment, but the strategic plan and research agenda for the NIH is weighted to both naturally occurring as well as genetically modified microbes. How many, um, Dr. McClellan, I'll start with you and work to Mr. Brown. How many medical countermeasures, diagnostic drugs, and vaccines do you estimate we will need in the end to protect ourselves? I can't give you a specific number. One of the things that comes out of the threat assessments and that will come out of our work under BioShield is a much clearer assessment of what is possible. By, and when will that be? Uh, well, by passing this legislation, we will generate a higher level of interest among the private sector researchers and others in identifying countermeasures. We've identified a number that we think can be developed right away, including better treatments for smallpox, better treatments for botulism, better treatments for anthrax. But we think there are a lot of other opportunities out there. So I can't give you an exact number, uh, but I do, I, I do think that because this is an unexplored and, and really underutilized area of research. Brown, thank you. I, I want to move along. Here. Homeland Our, Security has to rely on their expertise for those kinds of okay, answers. Okay. You have no sense. Dr. Klein? It's difficult to say exactly which numbers, but I agree with Is your mic on? Just tap it. 
Thank you. Thank you. I uh, agree with my colleague, uh, Dr. McClellan, is that it's difficult to come up with an exact number, but we will, uh, if we have a system in place that can be versatile, I think that's what would protect the American public. Okay, the Def this Defense Science Board listed 19 priority bioterror agents. First, uh, Dr. Fauci, would you uh, just respond to the question, and then I want to, the question I started with Dr. McClellan, the question is how yeah. many medical countermeasures, diagnostic drugs, and vaccines do you estimate? Yeah. Difficult to assess, but we're, we, we are at least aiming at the sixth high priority category A and several on the category B list. So I would say the number we cannot tell you for sure, but we are, want to be flexible enough to move as, as, as new threats arise. Okay, I'll ask whoever can answer this. The Defense uh, Science Board listed 19 priority bioterror agents and found that today we have none of the diagnostics we need, none of the vaccines we need, and only one of the therapeutics we need to deal with them. Is this list of 19 pathogens the definitive list, or do we need to prepare for these and many other pathogens, some of which we don't even uh, exist yet? Who can answer that? Dr. Klein? We have, uh, as you might expect uh, on that list, we do have some vaccines available. For example, anthrax is on the list, smallpox is on the list. So we do have uh, uh, vaccines and treatments available. Uh, we need to continue those. That 19 list is uh, relatively accurate. Uh, but again, as uh, others have indicated, there will be future threats that, w that are not on that list. CDC lists 36 selected agents. Do we need countermeasures for all of them? Dr. Fauci? Potentially we do. We are using that list, that, which includes the, the top priority, Category A list of six that we're putting our major effort on, but there are several on the secondary or B or C list that we are also developing countermeasures or at least studying the basic biology of the microbes to prepare us better in case uh, genetically modified microbes appear. Okay, let me um, just ask about the issue of surveillance, diagnostic tools, and training medical personnel. Isn't that more important than any of the stuff that we're talking about right now? To be able to have a, a better a surveillance system and diagnostic tools and training medical personnel. Well, the the responses that the, we're, do these come first? Well, th this it's all part of a comprehensive strategy for dealing with the new threats of terrorism to this country. We need a, effective surveillance and and supporting research on better diagnostic techniques as well as building up our laboratory and monitoring capabilities is an important part of the response, uh, but so is research on developing effective countermeasures and strategies for containing an event if it actually occurs. They're all part of a comprehensive Do strategy. Do anybody disagree with that or is that? Agree. Story? Okay. Let me just ask this one last question then. Um, we are in a dangerous position with regard to antibiotics and have few antivirals. Do we uh, need some major research breakthroughs to develop the products we need to protect ourselves against a bioterror attack and antibiotic resistant organisms? The answer is yes. That is a problem, as I mentioned uh, in response to, uh, to Mr. Waxman's question, and it is an important part of our biodefense program in general, as well as our non-biodefense emerging and re-emerging disease, which I believe shows you the seamlessness between the two programs. Yeah, I'm going to, my second round, want to ask about the, uh, the uh, DOD joint vaccine acquisition. I'll be asking you, Dr. Fauci, some questions and Dr. Klein about that. Uh, Mr. Van Hollen, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Shays, and uh, welcome to all of you. I'm very proud to uh, have both the NIH and FDA in the 8th Congressional District, uh, so it's great to see both of you and had a chance to visit with um, you before. I appreciate uh, um, your willingness to work with our office on not just national issues, but some of the local issues um, as well. Uh, let me, many of the, much ground has been covered, but I do want to follow up on a couple things just so I have clear in my mind. The, the determination as to what the priorities are going to be in terms of what, um, whether it's biological weapons, chemical weapons, which ones uh, we, t we focus on as a priority. Is that decision, I understand it's part of a collaborative process, but, but is it the is it the Department of Homeland Security Defense that says to you know, NIH and, and that these are the ones we want to focus on now? After all, we have limited resources. We have to make choices. Who, who's responsible for making that decision as to what the priorities are for investing resources? Well, Congressman, I think what happens in, in uh, that regard is that we, both the Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security, will both work together to determine those. And sometimes they're slightly different. What the Department of Defense considers, for example, is not only the threat, but it has it been weaponized to negatively impact on the men and women in uniform accomplishing their mission. 
So what we do is, for example, we will come up with that threat list. We will evaluate it through our intelligence system. And certainly as we develop those lists, uh, we will work with the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, but our, which list is more important than others, it depends on exactly what your uh, mission is, for example, whether it's a warfighting mission or protecting civilians. Right, but I mean, as to, I assume we're going to be putting together a plan. I mean, right. And, and, and my, I guess my question, what's your timeline in terms of deciding? There are lots of chemical agents out there. There are lots of potential biological agents, a lot of different mutations, I understand. So w what, what are we going to... We, we already have that list. You have that list, okay. And, and, it, and it's prioritized. We have them ranked. We typically don't publicize that list at the Department of Defense. Okay, but you have that list and, and the NIH and F is, is doing research currently based on that list that you've put together. The Department of Homeland Security uh, and uh, Department of Health and Human Services also have a list in the, their list. Uh, uh, Department of HHS has their list A and B that is publicized. Okay, uh, okay. Um, now, does that also deal with the production of the production of countermeasures as opposed to just research? Who makes who makes the decision as to at what point we need to move into the actual production of the countermeasures? The production is a decision that is made with input from the Department of Health and Human Services based on the threat assessment. Where we ought to focus our resources in BioShield or more generally is, is based on a combination of where the greatest th threats are and where the greatest opportunities are and where you get that match, the potential for bringing a new countermeasure forward that will address a significant uh, terrorist threat, that's the priority in BioShield. Right. Yeah. I, 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 I see where, you, where your question is going because there, there really needs to be distinguished both the basic fundamental research that informs any list, uh, the decisions about that and how you track that is an NIH decision when, we, when it comes to research and FDA or CDC decision in the Department of Health and Human Services. As we mentioned earlier, we rely heavily on our colleagues in DHS and even in DOD in helping us to get a better uh, uh, feel for the actual threat assessment. However, there is a formal process in BioShield that Dr. McClellan just referred to that when you trigger the procurement component of it, it is, the, it is the Department of Homeland Security and Secretary Ridge who determines that this is the serious threat that we need to have the countermeasure for, and then the Department of Health and Human Services executes the research and public health measures to go into getting that particular countermeasure. Okay. And I guess, have there been any decisions to date with respect to the need to move forward on the production of any countermeasure? I think in terms of looking at uh, production, we have both, uh, we need the R&D to develop a, a product, and then um, as soon as that is evaluated, all of our agencies look at within limited resources, how can we best meet the uh, threats as we see them. Right. We have, for example, at the Department of Defense, we do have an anthrax vaccine production program. Uh, we work closely with the Department of Health and Human Services for the smallpox, for example. Right, I, I mean, remember at the time there was a lot of questions about whether we had adequate anthrax um, supplies or not. I guess with other than anthrax and smallpox, have there been any decisions with respect to moving ahead on production of other countermeasures for other, other agents, whether they're chemical or biological? We have worked with the Department of Homeland Security and others to identify some immediate opportunities which we think that BioShield would help us fulfill even more quickly. So for example, uh, a better vaccine for anthrax, a better, safer vaccine for smallpox, and better antitoxins for botulinum toxin uh, are all areas where the technology exists and what's needed is the funding to get companies to follow through to produce the actual products. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my next round of question, I do have a concern which Mr. Waxman raised with respect to resources that, you know, we have limited resources. That you are, can keep, that your, are, your time can keep going. What's that? Keep going. Can, I keep going. You have five more minutes. All right. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one question. Obviously, these, and it, there are all these possible threats out there, biological, chemical, nuclear. Uh, but as a nation, we obviously have to evaluate the threat, you know, the, the level of threat posed and the likelihood, um, uh, what kind of damage it could cause, the likelihood that we'll be faced with that threat versus what we know are, are very known threats that we're facing every day. You know, heart disease and a whole range of other medical problems that NIH is engaged in research with right today. And I am concerned uh, that this will, you know, it's one thing to add additional resources to this effort at a time of, uh, you know, since 9-11, uh, a national 
emergency and a focus on this, but I would hate to see it come at the expense of what we know are diseases that are, are harming and, and, and killing Americans every day. Uh, and so my question is, of, 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 the in, of the amount of resources that's, that's being invested in this effort um, in research, how much of that is coming out of what otherwise would be invested uh, in non, uh, you know, biological yeah. chemical research? If you look at the, the resource curve of the last two years, of which have been obviously very heavily weighted in the arena of biodefense, the other areas in fact have not suffered. Now obviously the NIH has gone through a doubling which it has completed successfully. Um, the next few years obviously if one looks at what is coming forth as the budget from the administration as was expected it's not going to continue at that level. It is reaching a point of, of plateauing but within the framework of that again we have tried as best as possible to not damage the effort and the momentum in other areas. So what has happened thus far with the budget, with the doubling of the budget has not taken away from other areas. It has been a substantial and very generous increase in the NIH's budget. I'd like to respond to that from the standpoint of product development. After you've done the basic research, approve the, con the concept, is this going to take away from the development of much needed new products for cancer, heart disease, and other priority areas. We've seen over the past decade a huge expansion of the biotech sector, pharmaceutical research and development, and so forth. While NIH's budget has been doubling, the research investments in development and applied stages on the private side have also been doubling as well. And what is responsible for that is the potential for some real breakthroughs, especially in naturally occurring diseases that the private sector is trying to step up to, to address. By adding on these additional financial incentives for BioShield, we provide more incentives to get more investment activity, research and development in these other priority areas as well. As long as the financial incentives are there, the incentives to develop products will be there. We, won't, we aren't taking away incentives in cancer, heart disease and naturally occurring diseases. We're correcting a deficiency that exists in these unnatural diseases. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. I've got a question for the panel. Do you consider the uh, acquisition flexibilities that are contained in the, in the Senate bill, uh, do you think they provide adequate incentives to spur the development and the supply of uh, critical countermeasures? Well, we, we do think that they would provide some much needed incentives. Uh, obviously, there have been some different views expressed about what's needed to actually bring these next generation products to the public. and we're absolutely willing to work with this committee and other experts on making sure we've got the right framework in place to do that. I do think the most critical elements there, making sure that there's a certainty of payment, sometimes years in advance, if an effective, highly valuable product is actually developed, approved, and delivered for use by the public in the event uh, of a terrorist or other emergency health threat. Well, so that's there, the key point. There is a consensus here that we just don't have the in-house capability to take this in government and do it by ourselves. Is absolutely. that correct? Yeah, Everyone no agree absolutely. with that? No question about that. And there's no way we could build that up in any short period of time. Correct. So we are, by necessity, forced to go to the private sector to incentivize them yeah. to do things they otherwise wouldn't do. Yeah. Of which they do very, very well. That's the other issue. Yeah. It, it, they, it, they do it very, very well. It's, it's not hard, I mean, it's not easy to develop a product that is safe and effective and reliably produced even after you've gotten to, through the basic research and have a proof of concept. There is a lot of testing that needs to be done of potential toxicities uh, that need to be determined in each individual case. There is effectiveness testing, which is particularly challenging in this area because you can't do uh, normal testing on humans. And then there are all kinds of challenges to getting ramped up efficient production, labeling, and delivery uh, of the product. These are things that the private sector does extremely well in many other areas of medical technology, and we've seen the benefits of that for the public. We haven't seen those same kinds of benefits here, and we need them. I mean, one of the, one of the concerns, I guess one of the differences we have is, is uh, uh, and we're going to hear from in the next panel, uh, the concerns that the uh, Project BioShield does not really uh, afford the manufacturers of the biomedical countermeasures enough protection against product liability lawsuits. Uh, obviously, they're going to be engaging in research and development and manufacture things they wouldn't do otherwise. We're trying to get them to do it 
if they are exposed to massive lawsuits, uh, you could bring the company down, expose uh, uh, the rest of their business. Uh, uh, I don't know what the right balance is. That's something that uh, we need to, to, to try to find. And uh, the, the companies, I think, are rightfully good to try to get as much protection as they can, uh, maybe more than they need. And uh, anybody have a feel for the right balance here? As a general matter, we ha the administration has expressed some concerns about problems of liability exposures for manufacturers creating um, roadblocks to developing needed new treatments. And in this case, it, it is something that, uh, that we all need to think carefully about. Uh, we believe that there's a lot that can be done under current authorities, Section 85804 authorities that we have and under the Safety Act to provide uh, in protection for manufacturers for products that are being purchased by the government and used in these emergency situations. But obviously this is an issue that needs careful attention and should be addressed effectively. And traditionally it's been a tough issue in, in the Congress, uh, the House and Senate a little divided on it as well. Um, finally, uh, to uh, uh, Ms. Brown and Dr. Fochi, the administration's proposal gives the President permanent funding authority for research development and uh, production of bioketo biochemical countermeasures. What do you think this could end up costing at the end of the day? The, uh, the initial projection that was made based, and, and again, this is something that we, we try to scope out because you're dealing with scientific opportunities that can change due to breakthroughs as well as change in the risk assessment. But in the President's proposal, the 10-year proposal for the prior Project BioShield procurement was about 5.5 by 5.6 billion okay. over 10 years. Our problem, of course, is we don't know what diseases could come forward, what the next right. SARS could right. be. Uh, yeah. What yeah. It could be more, it could be less. Yeah. I would like to emphasize, though, that none of this money gets spent unless, number one, we make a determination that the countermeasure is needed and is truly valuable. We set the terms for the contract. If we don't think a countermeasure is worth the cost, it's not going to get a contract. Right. And then we don't actually pay anything unless that, we don't actually pay any significant amount unless that countermeasure actually gets delivered and does work. But what's clear is that the current law just does not, uh, you know, afford us the, the flexibility yeah. that we need to encourage industry right. to get into this. We, we can't give assurances to them, as I said in my opening statement. We can't tell them when they deal with us and say, we want to get involved in this. Uh, we're willing to take risks even. We, we have people who come with, to us and say, we have, we, we've, re, we've reached a certain point and now we need to go to the next step of building a new plant or investing another hundred million dollars or so, but we're, we're willing to take that risk, but we're not willing to take a risk of being successful in what we do and then finding out that no one wants to buy the product. So can you give us an assurance on the current law, given the vicissitudes of the, of the appropriation process, we really can't give them firm assurances that if they deliver as Dr. McClellan said, a, a, a licensable, a licensed uh, bio account, biomedical countermeasure, we can't give them the kinds of assurances under the current situation that we would be able to do on the Project BioShield. Great. Okay, let me ask any other uh, questions over on this side? Uh, uh, Mr. Weissman and Mrs. Norton have something. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Weissman. Chairman. Uh, <coughs> let me ask about the uh, procurement, streamlined procurement uh, uh, acquisition procedures. Uh, The, 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 um, there's a simplified acquisition authority here. And these authorities in the law were established for commercially available items such as office furniture or automobiles. And the idea was that there's a developed market for these products and the government can rely on, this mar on market forces to keep the prices low. Uh, when the government's bidding for a special government service, however, there's no market that's available to keep costs low and two basic safeguards have been developed. One, requirements for bidding and full and open competition. And when the contract is cost-based, the ability to inspect the contractor's books. As I understand it, the procurement provisions waive or relax both of these standards. I'm in favor of speeding up the procurement where there is a need, but at the same time, how do we protect the taxpayers? If the contract is cost-based, how does the government know it is not being overcharged if it can't audit the contractor's books? Mr. Brown, do you want to respond? Or anybody on the panel want to mm -hmm. respond to that issue? Well, I'll take a, a, just a, a brief shot at it, Mr. Waxman. We appreciate that concern, and there's, there's obviously a lot of scrutiny in, 
in what we will be doing because we're not, we're acting only in very special circumstances. But your point is very well taken and we're very sensitive to it. The main concern that we have is that we do not slow down the procurement process to the point where it interferes with the responsibility for what we have. Uh, we are not dead set against re-looking at that with you and we in fact would be willing to work with you in the committee on that concern which, which you've expressed, but the critical really bottom line issue is that we really cannot slow down the process. And if we right. could figure out a way together to do that, right. we'd be more than happy I to discuss that, this with you. I understand that, but we're changing the procurement right. uh, law, right. and, uh, and if the government doesn't have a market right. to drive the prices right. lower, and it's a cost-based uh, re uh, reimbursement, and we don't have the ability to look at right. their books and know whether we're right. getting ripped off, uh, that puts us that's, that's in, in a position of being deep pockets, and I, I think we've got to evaluate the balance right. here to make sure that uh, we're protecting the taxpayers, not just the American public. And we'd be willing to work with you. And if, if I could just add, the, the whole goal here is to create something like a market. You're right, there is no market that exists now, but the contracting authorities that BioShield would create would permit more than one firm to compete to get this countermeasure produced first. And again, we're paying for results primarily, not for just costs along the way. And these simplified acquisition authorities have been shown to work pretty well in combination with anti-kickback laws and fraud laws and the like uh, to prevent that ki those kinds of concerns in many cases. It'll be a so while like before there'd be a market if you're, if you're helping a company develop a product for which there's no availability at the present time. So we help them we help, uh, with money and then we streamline the process for them and they develop it and we give them the patent and they'll have exclu exclusivity over that and then we're buying it from them. We want to be sure that uh, uh, since there's no real competition, we're, we're, we're protecting the, our taxpayers' uh, money. Uh, absolutely. I, I do think we can create some competition there by contracting with more than one company and giving a larger payment to the one that gets there first. Will the gentleman yield for just a second on yeah, that? Yeah, but okay. just on that sure. anti-kickback, uh, you say that that's a protection, but as I understand, um, the, the, the anti-kickback law is exempted under the proposal, so we won't even really have that available to us if that's something that won't come into play. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, I, mean, I think the gentleman raises an interesting point. On the other hand, for the most part, we're going to give this on a results-oriented basis. Yeah. If companies go out and do research and they come up with a, basically a dry hole, they probably get nothing. Is that correct? Right. That's right. Payment yeah. for research. Unlike a lot of IT contracts where we end up buying information technology, spend billions and sometimes get systems that don't work. So you, you, at least it's result-oriented, which right. cuts down uh, the, the, the uh, fraud and abuse and waste that could right. come otherwise. But there is a question of balance and it, how sophisticated right. are we on our side? and and uh, look forward to working uh, with Mr. Waxman and others trying to find the, the, uh, the right balance there. I think it raises a good point. Uh, Let me ask a question on this liability issue. I, I understand why we'd want to give uh, uh, liability protection to the manufacturers of these products. That's very much on their minds and we want to give them all the incentives. But on the other hand, if we're, if, if we're going to indemnify the companies that uh, ma manufacture countermeasures by providing them with liability protection, some of these products still may harm consumers uh, if the administration can guarantee liable to liability protection to manufacturers, should it also compensate those who are injured by the products? There is, as you know, a lot of discussion ongoing now about compensation in the case of smallpox, which is a countermeasure that right. does have some significant adverse effects on in, uh, in certain cases. The idea for the kinds of technologies that we hope to develop here is to have some that are significantly safer and more effective uh, that would reduce the need for those kinds of uh, compensation activities. And also, the, the use here will be under conditions that are very much defined by the government in emergency situations and the like, and that we at FDA have approved to determine that the treatments are appropriate for use under these circumstances. So it's, a, in many ways, a kind of more limited uh, case and problem than, I know, I know smallpox is on your mind, but, uh, uh, but it's a more, much more limited situation than that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to take advantage of the fact that Dr. McClellan is here to ask him about a different issue uh, unrelated to the BioShield. At a hearing, we, we yeah, had I assured him that wouldn't happen, but that's fine. He's, he's a big boy. <laughs> oh, uh, that's fine. <laughs> now go ahead. That's fine. If Congressman he doesn't Waxman feel is always ready up front to answer the question, I would certainly accept that response, too. Uh, but we had a hearing on Internet pharmacies uh, several weeks ago, and a representative from the Federal Trade Commission 
testify that any claim that a dietary supplement containing ephedra is safe would be false and misleading under his view at the Federal Trade Commission. I want to know if you agreed with their view on the safety claims on ephedra products and to ask you whether you're aware of any studies that prove that ephedra containing dietary supplements are safe for the general public. We just conducted or just completed a review by the RAND Corporation that I know you're very familiar with because we talked with your staff about it uh, on the issue of the safety and effectiveness of ephedra. And as you know, under the dietary supplement law, um, we don't get the evidence up front on dietary supplements that they are safe and effective before they go on the market. We have to prove a safety problem or an effectiveness problem before we can uh, take any regulatory action. And that was the point of the RAND study. Subsequent to the RAND study, we reopened the record on FDA's old 1997 regulation to restrict use of ephedra based on safety and effectiveness concerns, and we've asked for comments from the public. And I noted today that we uh, just got one in from the American Heart Association. I hope that there's going to be more coming before this comment period closes. That is going to help us address this issue of ephedra safety. What the RAND report said, as you know, uh, was that while there have been some serious adverse events associated with ephedra, they could not prove a causal link between ephedra use and those events because these events are. Well, let's flip it the other way. If you can't show that it's harmful, can you do you know of any studies that prove that uh, ephedra containing dietary supplements are safe? No, it hasn't. It hasn't been proven to be safe. But as you know, the statutory standard is not. No, I'm not set asking up about the way. statutory standard. That's another issue, uh, and I understand that's important. But I was just asking about that. But what, did you, what do you think about this comment by the representative for the Federal Trade Commission that if, if there was a claim that the supplement that contained ephedra was safe, that this would be a, a false and misleading statement? It, it, it could well be a, a problem with truthful and, and, mis, and not misleading standards, which do govern both FTC's uh, advertising regulation and our labeling regulations. Um, so that is, a, that is a potential concern. My hope, though, is that we can do more to address the, the concerns that exist today about the way that ephedra is marketed, and that's the, way, the reason that we reopened this comment period and uh, have laid out a, uh, our preliminary view that the law doesn't require us to prove that ephedra is unsafe, rather that uh, we need to demonstrate that it presents an unreasonable risk to the public as it's currently marketed, and we hope that uh, we'll get some comments from you uh, about how we can best address that as well. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chase, any more questions? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Fauci, what is the relationship between NIH and DOD joint vaccine acquisition of JVA program? Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chase. The, the, the NIH has worked in the past um, with DOD and in some respects with the JVAP program, and we are now increasing our uh, collaborations, particularly with U.S. AMRID. Um, the joint vaccine acquisition program, as you know, which was operational in 1998, was focusing more on the long-term development of products against biological warfare. And we at the NIH feel that it doesn't directly address the urgent and civilian needs and demands that we have. And that's one of the reasons why we've looked for alternative ways to hasten uh, the development and interest and industry in vaccine development. So although we've interacted with them on JVAP, but even more intensively broadly with U.S. AMRID, uh, this is not an important part of our program. So your basic position is it's not going to fit into the Project uh, BioShield program? No, it's not in our mind, sir. Has the uh, JVAP been the subject of third-party evaluations? Uh, yes, it has. The, in in the, uh, December, I believe, of 2000, there was a report called the Top Report, was a report to the, the Deputy Secretary of Defense by an independent panel of experts, and they uh, came up with some uh, uh, areas that were problematic with regard to, to JVAP and talking about ways that need to be improving it. And I think uh, uh, instability of funding was cited as a major deficiency as well as some lack of scientific oversight. So they, 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 it's been a, a, a somewhat of a problem. I'm, I haven't been intimately involved are, are in it. Are you being a little gentle in, in describing the evaluations? I mean, there's $300 million that's been spent. I mean, uh, weren't uh, the, the reviews pretty uh, strongly yes. critical? Very strongly critical? They, they were quite critical of the program, sir, yes. Um,
Dr. Klein, how would you kind of respond? First off, Dr. Fauci, is there anything else you would want to say uh, about this program? You're basically telling me you're not going to, you don't see it being involved in the BioShield program. Uh, are there lessons we have learned from this? I mean, can, in terms of what we do with BioShield? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, um, we learned a lot of lessons along the way. One of the things I think we learned that we have to have as we have built into BioShield is a significant amount of scientific oversight and, and stability of funding and some strategic planning of where you're going to go and to try and bring in the very best of industry and not give them the full component, as Dr. McClellan has mentioned, until we have a deliverable product. One of the difficulties with putting a lot of money up front and up forward without getting a product or at least any guarantee of a product, that there's always the risk of failure. And that's what we're trying to avoid by making the stipulation of BioShield that you have to have a licensable product that's delivered before you get your full payment. Dr. Klein, is there anything you want us to know about uh, uh, JVAP? Well, and, con and Congress Shays, I, I think uh, the comments made earlier are quite accurate. As you know, that uh, this program, uh, JVAP, was started in about 1997. It's a 10-year program, so it's uh, was a start, but I think uh, our uh, experience with JVAP uh, demonstrates uh, BioShield's uh, value. For example, <coughs> incentives uh, for companies to go uh, towards making products. And then the other one that I think is uh, more important, certainly after 9-11, is that uh, we need interagency cooperation between DOD, uh, DHHS, and Homeland Security. So I think uh, we really need to look at this in a more comprehensive manner. As you know, JVAP was intended to uh, meet the needs of the men and women in uniform. That was its initial intent. After 9-11, I think we realized that uh, they're not the only ones that need these uh, vaccines. Right, but, but so far the program has spent a lot of money and has not has been found wanting, correct? There uh, are, it, uh, I think the original JVAP, the intent was good, but it's not been as uh, successful Fair as enough. we wanted. Let me just ask this, if, uh, Dr. Fauci, if we manage to engage the industry, what is the most useful role for NIH and its grantees? How does it focus on research that is not competitive and duplicative with that of the industry? Yeah. Um, traditionally, and we hope it continues and amplifies, is that the NIH research has really been the fuel that fires the engine uh, towards the ultimate translation into products which the industry does so well. That's not to say that the industry does not do some very important research themselves, but it has really been essentially a continuum where NIH grantees provide the basic research, the proof of concept, and even the development up to but not including advanced development. We generally push the envelope into phase one, phase two trials, and the early part of development. That would be a natural marriage that we would see work well with BioShield to then call upon industry to make the investment in what they do so well as delivering a product. So it's, it's quite complimentary, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I ask one more question? Thank you. Um, Mr. Brown, um, what are the problems the government faces in trying to engage biotech and pharmaceutical companies in launching research and development projects to develop medical countermeasures? I, I think it's the lack of a, a secure source of funding. They need to know that uh, if, if, we, if we make the, the determination that based, there's an imminent danger, there is a real threat out there, and they can produce something that's results-oriented, they can show us a product that they're going to get paid for it. That's the biggest, that's the, it's the lack of the incentive. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all very much. Uh, we, we appreciate it very much, Dr. Fauci. Thank you for, for being here, Dr. McClellan, Mr. Brown, Dr. Klein. It's been very, very helpful, and we're ready to move to our next panel of witnesses. Dismissed. Our second panel includes industry and academic experts who will give us their views on this proposal. Uh, we have Frank Rappaport, an attorney representing Aventus Pasteur. Next, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Michael Friedman on behalf of the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers Association of America. We also have Dr. Una Ryan, a president of the Avant uh, uh, Immunotherapeutics located in Needham, Massachusetts. And uh, Dr. Catherine Bowdish uh, as well. She's president of the Alexa and Antibody Te Technologies located in Cheshire, Connecticut. And rounding out the panel is Dr. John Edwards, Chief of Infectious Diseases uh, at UCLA. I'll give everyone a minute to get up. We ha have your name tags uh, appropriately.
And uh, thank you for bearing with us through the questioning of the first panel. Uh, we have a red, we have the light in front, and when it it'll be green for three minutes, uh, uh, for four minutes, then it turns orange for the last minute, and when it turns red, we want you to sum up. Your entire testimony is in the record, and uh, it, we we or, or staff have, have read it all and have questions prepared on that. But you can use your five minutes to highlight. I'm going to ask you to stand with me to be sworn in, if you can do that. Solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Um, we will start with uh, Mr. Rappaport. We'll move straight down the line. And thank you again for being with us. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Frank Rappaport, a partner in the Philadelphia office of McKenna, Long, and Aldridge where I practice government contract and public health law. I had the privilege of working both in the Carter and Reagan Justice Departments in the government contract section, and more recently was involved in both smallpox procurements, the first one pre-9-11, and the anthrax procurement more recently at NIH on behalf of pharmaceutical companies. I'm pleased to testify today on behalf of Aventus Pasteur, the largest vaccine manufacturer in the world, devoted entirely to vaccine research, development, manufacturing, manufacturing a billion and a half doses annually based in its headquarters in Northeast Pennsylvania. My purpose today is limited to offer some technical amendments to this bill which may make the difference between success and failure in either attracting the best and the brightest or simply those who have nothing to lose but accepting government money. I offer five points to achieve broader and bolder procurement authority, all giving discretion to the various secretaries to use as arrows in their quiver. There is no doubt that the existing government regulations, known affectionately as the FARs, give contracting officials ample authority to make contractors perform. Our five points today will protect the contractor against all but its own failure. Point one, the bill, quite frankly, is a little stiff. It does not amply provide for a single procurement that combines both research and development and a guarantee of production. There must, in our view, be a linkage to get the attention of companies like Aventus who are going to be passing up lost opportunities and feeling the uncertainty without commitment for production. Point two is related to this. These contracts should also recognize the costs of capital and return on capital. It should assure payments sufficient to amortize investment, which would include return of capital and return on capital. The point is, if we're not going to be accepting government money under R&D within this contract, we need to make sure that our investors feel comfortable that there is a product at the end of the pipeline and in the event most importantly, of an early termination for convenience because, for instance, Mr. Dr. Fauci has found yet a better drug. The company must know that it's going to get reimbursed for the work that it spent on its own nickel under that government contract. The existing termination for convenience regulations do not allow for recovery of what we would call loss of interest or investor cost. So when I suggest the bill's a little stiff, we feel it's a very good bill, but you need to be heard loud and clear that we want to give much broader authority to the secretary to encourage companies to perform. How can this be accomplished in one contract vehicle? It would be one contract where research and development is included. We're not suggesting who's going to pay for that. That's up to the government to negotiate with the company. At the same time, there's a guarantee of production, but the cost of the units will not be determined until the research and development is over. This is always done in a privatized procurement. We call it price determination. That can be done to include the estimated cost of productions as well as a capital charge. Point three, we strongly encourage you to move beyond plain vanilla government contracts. 
something you're well aware of on this committee called other transactions, used routinely by DARPA and NASA, and actually generated the Predator, the unmanned vehicle that's being used in Afghanistan. These are commercial-like arrangements that entice and allow government contractors, like Aventis, to feel free that they will get to protect their rights. Point four, as proposed, in the bill, a five-year contract without subsequent guaranteed appropriations appears to run afoul of 31 U.S.C. 1341. You certainly can just take a minor correction to make sure that this act is taken care of. Finally, the issue that you've heard already today, indemnity. We truly understand the urgency of this bill, but we feel obligated to note the issue of liability protection remains a concern for us. Both HHS and DHS have authority on public law 85804. It's used rarely. Most recently, President Bush signed an executive order which even cuts back on the authority of public law 85804. Currently, while DHS has used this act, we understand it is not until after a contract is awarded. Imagine a bidder looking at dealing with inhalation airborne anthrax during clinical studies. A bidder, a company such as Aventus, would certainly like to know for its shareholders that it can bank on a likelihood of indemnity post-award. In summary, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important issue. Aventus has been, as you know, we were the donator of 85 million doses of smallpox vaccine. We will be committed to supporting the efforts of the secretaries to contributing to our common defense. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Friedman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members. On behalf of the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, I'm pleased to be here today to share with you the views of the research-based pharmaceutical industry on the President's Project BioShield initiative. Biological weapons represent an increasingly serious danger to people around the world. The dynamic complexity of the problem is demonstrated by science's difficulties in dealing with naturally occurring infectious disease as well as intentional bioterrorist threats. While pharma companies are developing more than 200 new medicines to treat or prevent various infectious diseases, reports by the National Academy of Sciences, the NIH Blue Ribbon Panel for Biodefense Research, and the U.S. Defense Science Board make it clear that an even larger number of more diverse types of countermeasures must be developed, and they must be developed promptly. Although the basic science research required for countermeasure development is being supported by federal agencies, it is widely recognized that more sponsored research is needed. There also needs to be more flexible authority and more resources for regulatory agencies. In short, those things which will advance the development and production of the countermeasures. Pharma member companies have been active in moving forward on countermeasure research and development. As indicated in my written testimony, for example, Pharma is working with CDC, DOD, NIH, FDA, and academia to support in vitro studies of five important pathogens as model systems for antibiotic testing. Several companies are working with the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease to help test existing antibiotics against plague. Other examples of ongoing collaboration uh, are outlined in my testimony. A cooperative and collaborative research and development effort which engages industry, government, and academia will, however, be essential to this effort. Pharma believes that Project BioShield is an important step toward this, and we support the three main components of the President's proposal. The President's proposal speaks primarily to the early and to the later stages in the lengthy, high-risk, and costly process of bringing new medicines to the market. It does not, however, speak to the time-consuming and resource-intensive middle portion of that process, which is largely our responsibility. Further, research into biothreat countermeasures presents challenges beyond those ordinarily encountered in non-biodefense R&D. These include scientific challenges, economic challenges, and legal challenges. And I'll enumerate a couple, if I may. For example, some products will be distributed without the typical battery of clinical trials that are required for FDA approval. All medicines present an inherent and unavoidable risk of adverse events. As a result, manufacturers may be exposed to devastating product liability suits. Private insurance can be unavailable or prohibitively expensive in this situation. 
Secondly, the need for rapid development of countermeasures may require the sharing of scientific information and cooperation among companies. For example, the sharing of data by researchers working in different laboratories. Collaboration and cooperation in this research might create exposure under current antitrust laws. Thirdly, diverting resources from research and development of other medicines will affect the future availability of treatments and cures for patients with other serious health conditions, especially since only a tiny percent of all drugs that enter testing ever demonstrate sufficient human safety and acceptable efficacy. The allocation of resources can be particularly difficult for companies with few products in the pipeline. In order to best meet the public health needs of our citizens, Pharma looks forward to working with, in a transparent manner, Congress and the administration to enact measures that will provide uh, uh, appropriate uh, product liability protection for products that are procured under BioShield and for products that are distributed under the emergency authorization procedures of BioShield. Although existing indemnification authorities are a helpful step in the right direction for some government contractors, they are not an appropriate model for legislation implementing Project BioShield. Instead, we would urge Congress and the administration to expand and, as appropriate, modify the liability protection model that this Congress has already put in place for smallpox. Pharma also looks forward to working closely with Congress and the administration to enact narrowly tailored measures to address existing antitrust constraints, as appropriate, in order to allow needed collaboration and consortia among scientists and industry. My written testimony includes a memorandum from outside counsel explaining both the need uh, and the precedent for narrowly tailored antitrust provision that would apply in this very special context. Cooperation and strong commitment from all parties will be necessary in the months and years to come as our nation seeks to protect itself against the terrible threats of biowarfare and bioterrorism. America's pharmaceutical companies look forward to doing our part. I thank you for this opportunity to address you and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Ryan, thank you for being with us. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you very much for inviting me to testify before you on Project BioShield. I'm the president and CEO of Avant Immunotherapeutics, a small 60-person biotech company in Massachusetts. I'm also on the board of the Biotechnology Industry Organization, and I'm chairman-elect of the Massachusetts Biotechnology Council. As the federal government embarks on BioShield, a new and uh, challenging program to fight bioterrorism and biological warfare, let me assure you that the biotechnology industry stands ready to contribute and work towards its success. Our eagerness to participate, <coughs> however, cannot be unqualified. As the leader of a small company, I cannot embark on the development and supply of biodefense vaccines if doing so doesn't make business sense. Let me, if I may, give you my view of BioShield from the perspective of a small company. Avant is a small company and it's a vaccines company. Prior to 9-11, we made vaccines for protecting travelers against cholera, typhoid fever, and dysentery. We make antiviral vaccines for diarrhea in babies, for food safety, and we even have a vaccine that raises your HDL, your good cholesterol. After September the 11th, we moved to apply our advanced vaccine technologies to biodefense, as they have much to offer. For example, the current inventory anthrax vaccine provided to US troops is administered through multiple injections, about six over about 18 months, which are often painful with side effects. And once the injections have begun, the protection develops gradually over several months. We think we can do better. And to my great pride, we signed a contract in January that allows us to supply our most advanced vaccine know-how to the biodefense effort. Under our contract with DVC, Dyneport Vaccine Company, the prime contractor to the Defense Department's JVAP, Joint Vaccine Acquisition Program, we've begun development of a single dose oral vaccine that will protect our troops against both anthrax and plague at the same time. 
This vaccine will have the same features as our cholera vaccine developed for the travelers market, administered in a single oral dose, safe and well tolerated by the recipient, with immunity developing very rapidly in days, not weeks or months. Manufacture of this vaccine is easy and inexpensive to current generation by comparison with current generation vaccines. And in addition, we can provide this in a form that does not require refrigeration. Under the current plan, we expect to complete preclinical development of this vaccine by the end of calendar year 2004. To my knowledge, it's the most advanced vaccine technology currently under development anywhere in the government's biodefense program, civilian or military. So how does this experience shape my view of BioShield? Here are the central characteristics that I'll be looking for in BioShield. First, BioShield must create a market of sufficient size to convince the industry that we have a partner who understands the cost and complexity and risk of developing therapeutics and bringing them to market. Now, the research and early uh, clinical stages may take tens of millions, but as you move through the final stages of clinical development over the finish line, it takes hundreds of millions. And biotech companies will want to see a federal program of sufficient size to convince them that our effort can be funded throughout the life cycle of the program. Second, there must be a long-term commitment of funding. The development of biomedical countermeasures takes time. Five to 10 years is very aggressive, and more than 10 years is not uncommon. And although we're making quick progress on things such as anthrax and plague, there are other less well-known agents that may become terrorist threats, and we've heard a lot of talk this morning about SARS, and we've barely begun to work on that yet, though some of the technologies will apply. To meet the nuclear missile threat, the government has spent a minimum of $3 million annually for, I think, now 20 years. That kind of long-range commitment will convince companies that the government is serious about defeating biological threats. Third, there must be careful coordination, and we touched on this earlier, among the agencies, including a program management function that can bridge the divide between the NIH and the early discovery and research phases and the procurement at the Department of Homeland Security. And one of the most experienced acquirers of complex products is the Department of Defense. And in the Department of Defense, in JVAB, they have a program management function that I think could well be applied through the life cycle of products as they progress through BioShield and bridge the gap between the NIH and the Department of Homeland Security. Fourth, two of my colleagues have mentioned it, there must be adequate liability protection. I'm not going to go into it further, but simply say that from the point of view of a small company, it isn't even a meritorious legal case that is a threat. Even just the threat itself of liability is enough to prevent investment and put small companies out of business. So this is a risk that small companies simply can't take. The bill introduced by Senators Lieberman and Hatch also provides for liability protection. Their legislation offers this protection in the context of comprehensive incentives for biotechs, and perhaps an approach like that can be incorporated into the BioShield concept of government-created markets that pull firms into this worthy effort. So although I'm very optimistic about the opportunity for success, I want to close with a personal experience that actually leaves my hope tinged with concern and frankly keeps me awake at night. Um, we at Avant have put huge amount of resources into our program for a single dose oral anthrax plague vaccine. And we have a partner who is willing, the JVAC Joint Vaccine Acquisition Program, but we found that uh, the 2004 budget has been slashed from the level it received in fiscal 2003. So even if we are successful and deliver 
absolutely on the contract that we have now for the preclinical two-year program. I am very concerned about the future of what's a really outstanding vaccine approach because, as you heard, there may be rather little incorporation of the Department of Defense programs into BioShield. So I want to be sure that this doesn't become an example of how, despite the best of intentions, failure of the many agencies involved to keep their coordinated eye on the biodefense ball could undermine effective programs and partnerships. So I remain hopeful that working together, the government and industry can make BioShield work for the national interest. I applaud your leadership in holding this hearing and meeting the challenge, and I assure you that our industry will be a willing partner. Thank you very much, and I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Bowdish, thanks for being with us. Uh, Chairman Davis and distinguished members of the committee, I'm honored to present this testimony on the application of monoclonal antibodies, the very latest biotech solution for defense against the very real threat of bioterrorism facing our nation today. It's my understanding that the BioShield initiative is designed to give key federal agencies what amounts to fast-track authority for the review and approval of private sector solutions to fight the agents of bioterrorism. I wholeheartedly support the concept behind this and other legislative approaches such as a Lieberman-Hatch bill in the Senate. There is no better way to generate new therapies than to let the top people in their respective fields bring the best ideas to the table. I know these legislative efforts importantly address long-term problems, but I also hope that NIH and other federal agencies will take immediate steps that address the very real threats that we all face right now. As we saw in the attacks against our nation in 2001, inhalation anthrax is a highly fatal disease if not identified early enough for antibiotics to be of use. Death usually occurs within a few days of the onset of acute symptoms primarily from the toxins produced by the anthrax bacteria, not the bacteria itself. In addition to antibiotics directed against the bacteria, successful anthrax defense will require agents against the toxins, otherwise known as antitoxins. Monoclonal antibodies are among the most logical and natural antitoxins that could be developed for the treatment of anthrax. Human monoclonal antibodies have been proven safe and effective for many therapeutic purposes and I am confident that they will have similar success as bioterror antitoxins. Alexion has successfully isolated human monoclonal antibodies with therapeutic potential for biodefense. For over a year, we have had antibodies that could provide the most complete protection from anthrax toxin available. These antibodies, either alone or in combination, may be useful as a prophylactic at the onset or during the course of an active infection. As detailed in the written testimony, this work has been discussed with and presented to a large number of scientific experts on anthrax and biodefense in industry, academia, and government. All of these indi individuals agree that the approach we are taking is a necessary and achievable component to U.S. biodefense initiatives. Alexion's biodefense program against anthrax has been entirely self-supported to date. We saw a need and we recognized that we had the ability to offer our technology and our expertise. And most importantly, we have demonstrated that our approach works. It is our hope that Congress can help us ensure that the appropriate decision makers in our federal government are aware of our critical and highly relevant work for consideration for civilian and military defense. It is our desire to coordinate with government officials to see that our antibodies and our expertise are utilized for emergency stockpile generation to protect both civilian and military populations. Building the necessary emergency stockpiles is certainly something that no one company can or should accomplish solely with private funding. Therefore, we are looking for assistance from the federal government through NIH for the final phase of development of this critical therapy. Further, we are currently applying the same technology to additional agents of bioterror in our research laboratories. Preliminary res results suggest we will have similar successes with smallpox, botulinum, plague, and others. At the minimum, we hope emergency stockpiles of monoclonal antitoxins will deter any would-be terrorists and alleviate public anxiety. Above all, it is my hope that we never have to look back from another bioterror attack and wonder, what more could we have done, and why did we wait? I thank the committee for this opportunity to present this testimony, and I welcome any questions. 
Thank you very much. Dr. Edwards, thanks for being with us. Chairman Davis and members of the committee, thank you for inviting the Infectious Disease Society of America, the IDSA, to present our views on the administration's Project BioShield. I am Dr. John Edwards, a professor of medicine at the School of Medicine at UCLA and chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the Los Angeles County Harbor UCLA Medical Center. Before I begin, I wanted to thank Dr. Fauci for his work on Project BioShield and his work in infectious disease in general. He is a member of our society. I am testifying today on behalf of the IDSA to convey our strong support for Project BioShield and the novel incentives it creates. However, the United States' most pressing infectious disease problems are not limited to infections that terrorists may propagate. An immediate crisis exists currently in U.S. hospitals and in our communities as natural occurring infections become increasingly resistant to approved antimicrobial products. Additionally, naturally occurring infectious diseases exemplified by meningitis, pneumonia, tuberculosis, and AIDS are still the leading cause of death worldwide and the third leading cause of death in the United States. Furthermore, emerging infections such as severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS and West Nile virus are continuing threats. Antimicrobial resistance, whereby microbes mutate and become less susceptible to drugs, has created special concerns. You probably know of the cases of vancomycin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or VRSA, that occurred in Michigan and Pennsylvania last year. This occurrence is highly significant since vancomycin is typically a last resort agent. Similarly, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, which previously affected mainly hospitalized patients, now is infecting healthy and strong individuals in our communities and across our country. Upon this background, the IDSA has learned that a, quote, perfect storm, if you will, is brewing as many pharmaceutical companies are considering or already have withdrawn from anti-infective drug development. Many companies have greatly curtailed, wholly eliminated, or spun off their anti-infective research components, especially over the last five years. A list of these major pharmaceutical companies is provided in our written statement. Antimicrobials work often quickly and with successful results. Understandably, pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies are inclined to develop products that treat long-term chronic illnesses because such products provide greater returns on investment. As U.S. demographics shift towards a more elderly population, we predict that companies will focus even more on chronic diseases in the future. Within the context of these realities, it is highly unlikely that we can reverse the antimicrobial market failure without some form of specific, well-designed intervention. Therefore, a national solution is needed to solve this national crisis. Project BioShield's long-term legacy will be enhanced significantly if it is amended to address the precipitous decline in the development of antimicrobial products to treat naturally occurring and resistant infections. Such amendments is supported by recommendations made by the Institute of Medicine in the Microbial Threats Report issued on March 18th. Thousands more Americans will succumb to naturally occurring infections in the next 10 to 15 years than to agents of bioterrorism, even if a bioterrorism attack occurs. And yet no plan is currently on the table to address this immediate public health crisis. We strongly support the concept of Project BioShield, but we unequivocally urge that it be amended to include a framework for action to protect Americans against naturally occurring and drug-resistant and emerging infections are increasingly present in our hospitals and communities. Chairman Davis, in your opening statement, you ask how can BioShield assist to address the SARS outbreak? In its current form, its assistance would be tangential. However, with amendments, it could do much. In closing, we sincerely thank the chairman and all members of the committee for the opportunity to discuss the urgent need for new technologies and tools to protect the U.S. citizens and global populations from both the threat of bioterrorism and the highly prevalent naturally occurring infections. 
The IDSA is available to assist in any way it can. Thank you for sharing these concerns with us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Evans. And, and I just, uh, the, the point you make uh, uh, that with some amendments, we may be able to shape this legislation up where it can help us with the SARS or the next Ebola or whatever is very, very important. Sometimes uh, we get an opportunity like this legislatively when we want to make it as inclusive as we can. So I think your point is well taken. We don't know what will happen from a bioterrorism point of view over the next decade. Uh, hopefully nothing. But there are going to probably continue to be SARS and mutations and things that uh, the private marketplace is going to be reluctant to uh, get into without uh, strong federal help. And having a system up that would uh, be uh, uh, that could include these areas, I think, would be very, very helpful. So uh, we'll take those all of your comments into account as we try to write uh, this legislation and move it uh, and move it through. Um, I'm concerned, and uh, I guess I'll ask everybody, uh, putting, uh, if, we, if we get this fund up, we put limited liability, uh, the other things that are asked for in the legislation, a concern of an unintended consequence downstream being that all of a sudden they putting so much into biomedical countermeasures, could it affect other biomedical research into more conventional areas? Uh, could you find uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies all of a sudden putting their research into these areas where you have a guaranteed uh, uh, fund at the end that will pay for these instead of taking the chance uh, in, in the marketplace? And uh, how will this affect more conventional research and development? And, uh, Dr. Friedman, look eager to, anybody's welcome to answer this. Thank you, I'll begin and, and I'm sure others will join in as well. The problem is, in a sense, caused by the fact that there's so many opportunities that are available. These are opportunities that have been made available because of the scientific investments that have been made in this country over the last 40 or 50 years. I think it's true to say that whether you're talking about an academic medical center, a pharmaceutical company, a large pharmaceutical company, or a small company, there are vastly more promising ideas for helping people today than we have the time, the energy, the resources, the expertise, or the dollars. And that's a continuing challenge for us all. As was pointed out, one of the reasons why uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers uh, have been putting less emphasis on infectious disease over the past decade is that there have been more urgent public health opportunities cancer, Alzheimer's, other very serious diseases where uh, companies thought that, that important investments made there would help more patients. As we have come to recognize that, that the threats to our health change, we must rebalance the equation. This, there are no simple answers. There aren't enough resources or people or time to address all the scientific and medical questions that legitimately exist. And it's a real challenge for all of us to try and define what that right balance is. We must make those assessments, and then we must constantly reevaluate and question those and decide how can we make the greatest contribution to the public health with which sorts of, 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 of investments of our energy and time and people. Yeah, I mean, in all fairness, you want to make contributions to public health, but you have a bottom line to your shareholders, too. And if the money is available out there in, these, in some of these other areas, uh, it, it may be a more sure investment than some of the other areas. No, in fact, I, 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 it's theoretically possible. I think by far the, the more driving consideration will be the, how how uh, how likely it is to be successful. So, if we have a wonderful insight into multiple sclerosis or diabetes, um, the, the opportunity to contribute there, as you're well aware, because you understand this. There's a huge number of things that are screened and begin testing, and a tiny, tiny percentage that end up, not because people are sloppy or they don't mm -hmm. care, because we just don't have the biologic insights. We simply, as sophisticated as we are, we're not sophisticated enough. Right. This is tough stuff. Dr. Ryan? Um, I think the unintended consequences will be all benefits. If you look at the countermeasures and the technologies we can offer now, they were all built on peacetime research and activities. And much of what I think we would benefit from in developing needle-free 
non requiring refrigeration vaccines would be equally useful for uh, travelers' vaccines, uh, food safety vaccines, uh, vaccines for global health. So it's the same intellectual property and technology that we would be leveraging into another area. So I would see all the boats rising, um, and I wouldn't see competition being a problem at okay. all. All right. Thanks. Um, for a countermeasure to be appropriate for procurement under the project BioShield, as envisioned by the administration, the Secretary of Health and Human Services has to make a determination that the product either is approved by the FDA or is likely to be approved within five years. Is that a reasonable approach? Uh, and what type of products would be covered by this time frame? And what type do you think would be excluded by this time frame? Any thoughts on that? Um, I believe that monoclonal antibodies will be able to be approved in this time frame. I think that um, in our case, um, speaking from a small company perspective, we already have antitoxin therapy available for anthrax. Um, I think it'll take us the next six months to get it through um, the, the next series of studies that we need to do and, um, and then likely into phase one safety studies. I think that um, our approach um, will be successful against the other agents that we um, will, are working on now and will be working on in the future. And I think that we can very quickly have uh, a rapid success um, with antitoxin therapies and antiviral therapies in the case of monoclonal antibodies. All right. Thank you. One of the, uh, uh, the areas you're going to see debated on both sides of this is uh, are we giving away too much to the companies? Are we, uh, in fact, not being tough enough? They're going to walk off with the big profits. Are we giving them too many protections and the like? But the bottom line for us is to be able to get incentives so the companies will step forward, take the risk, do the research. And it's clear from the last panel, government doesn't have this in-house capability. We, we've got to go out to the private sector. And we can write a law here that may have all kinds of safeguards and protections so, so that the government quote isn't getting taken. But if companies don't step up to the plate, the losers at the end of the day are going to be the consumers uh, because we're not, and, and, and people who are suffering uh, from this. What we wrestle with here is striking the right balance. And as we look at the administration's proposal, does it ha have enough incentives for private companies to begin research and development, do you think? Uh, do you think it has enough? Do you think it needs more? Do you think it goes too far and we ought to bring other safeguards? And I, I think all of you have different perspectives on that, but anybody want to take that? Go ahead. Dr. Friedman, you're with Pharma. Do you have a... Uh, very focus? briefly, sir. I think there, there, there are some incentives that are being discussed. I think equally important is addressing the disincentives that exist to try and optimize the, the system. I, I think that the looking at the, at the totality of what we're trying to create uh, for the American public, um, balances, careful discussions. Uh, these are complicated issues, and, and as others have said, we look forward to working with you and others to try and craft as specifically where there are special uh, descriptions in, in, in the legislation. We think those should be transparent, they should be clear, and they should be well focused. Okay, thank you, Mary. Anyone else on that? Um, what I like about the five-year idea is that there's a clear philosophy to support product opportunities, not just to support research. What I don't like about the five years is I think it's a bit tight. I mean, if somebody's progressing extremely well, I think it would be um, not useful to the country to cut it off if it went another couple of years. So this so is a why... a waiver provision or some extension I mean, would it's be a question of progress. And again, as I, I keep stressing, program management through the life cycle from research to having a product that could actually be used. Uh, I mean, your company spends a lot of money that sometimes ends up going nowhere, right, with research? Oh, yes. I mean, what percent, as you go off on a trail, how many times is, uh, does it lead nowhere? Most of the time is, okay. is a depressing thought. But in, in fact, um, the research is still useful. Other studies have been done, not just by my company, but when you get to the end of the road, it's one in 100, I think, is what makes it through to success. Uh, I think it depends where you start. It, yes. it could be as small as one in 10,000 or 100,000 if you look at the very earliest steps. And when something begins clinical testing, you, you, I think you're happy if it's one in 100. Uh, again, this is not just for anti-infectives, but for a variety of different medications. Mr. Chairman, I think the incentives are there, but they need to be firmed up. And let me give you a specific example. In the last anthrax procurement, 
um, which was won by a, um, a company whose name I can't recall, but the basic provision, the RFP, was for research and development only. So you stand back and you're chairman of a multinational drug company and you look at, am I gonna do research and development? I'd love to help, I wanna be there. In fact, it looks like the government's paying my way. What happens at the end of the contract? Nothing, you get no widget, you get no promise. In fact, the procurement said there'll be another RFP at the end of the research and development and you wonder, as outside counsel, how do you advise your company on, well, do you get the rights to the work that's been developed by the other companies that have won the R&D? So it's very simple in the sense that if you want to attract companies like Aventis, I think they're willing to share the risk, but they need to know that if they show you their stuff and they're successful, there is a guarantee that there's gonna be a market there. It's as if to say we fight a war in Iraq and Boeing's not there, Lockheed's not there, Northrop's not there. We've got some very sophisticated companies, but we need some of the big players with unlimited resources to participate in this as well. Okay. No, I mean, that's the American system. There's a huge upside when you get the success. If you don't get success, you end up eating the cost, but there is a huge upside. What you're saying here is there is no assurance of that in some of these cases. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I want to thank all the witnesses for their testimony. I, I <clears throat> had a conflict in my time schedule, so I wasn't here to, to hear you, but I've had a chance to review uh, the testimony, and we'll certainly uh, take into consideration all the things that you've given us, because I think it's uh, very helpful. Uh, Mr. Rappaport, you testified you assume checks and balances are in place to ensure appropriate stewardship to protect the taxpayer's money. It seems to me that the bill eliminates many guarantees to protect the taxpayer's interest, eliminating government access rights to uh, uh, the books of contractors, for instance, seems uh, questionable. What kind of checks do you think are in place? Yeah, I, I noticed uh, uh, from your earlier question that you were concerned about that. Remember, the simplified acquisition is only up to $25 million. After that, the full panoply of federal acquisition regulations with the masses of government auditors that are already over the pharmaceutical industry, they will be there. In my days at the Justice Department, we had the FBI, we had the IG. There's everybody there from those enforcers to the contracting officials who ask for one thing, get the stuff out the back door. As long as you can keep producing, there'll be no audits. So the $25 million, quite frankly, is a very low number to receive a relaxation of government acquisition enforcement. Most of this will be far in excess of $25 million. Well, the production side, however, it's not limited to that $25 million. It's our view that the production side doesn't even have the, the simplified acquisition in it. There's no relaxation. There's total, um, in fact, there's a very aggressive position which says that if you don't produce, Mr. Pharmaceutical Company, within three years, we're going to terminate you for default. That didn't have to be in there. There's already that ample authority mm -hmm. under the FAR. Mm -hmm. you, you've testified that companies need the certainty that research and development contracts will lead to a manufacturing agreement. Uh, and this, um, this is an important part as far as you can see to tie the two together. Yes, we're not assuming that the price has to be decided until mm -hmm. later in the contract, but the government does this type of price determination midway through a procurement all the time. Do companies make money on research and development contracts and uh, if so, why, why would you need a guarantee of a manufacturing agreement up front? Um, th there's probably a difference between a company like Aventis and a biotech. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not anxious to accept government money with, as you suggest, we're not government contractors. The pharmaceutical industry, I guess the Wall Street Journal calls them the new biodefense contractors. But a large pharmaceutical company wouldn't have the the institutional uh, competency to deal with what Boeing and Lockheed has. So they're not anxious to take government R&D money simply to earn a 7 or 
profit on top of the R&D. It's the manufacturing capability that they want and that they're best at, that they deliver. That's really why they, they are where they are. So at the beginning when I said our tinkering with a bill, and it's a good bill, is simply not only to encourage biotechs, who absolutely have to be there, but also the companies that have the ability to produce masses of quantities of vaccine, and they don't need the government's R&D money as long as they know that there is some kind of back-end commitment. Thank you. Dr. Friedman, good to see you again. Thank you, sir. You've indicated the importance of the liability protection. Why wouldn't the government contract or defense shield you from liability? Uh, I, I'm sorry, sir. Repeat the question. You, you indicated uh, the, the, the concern about the potential liability company, companies manufacturing these countermeasures uh, could face and their inability to retain private insurance. And I'm trying to understand why, um, uh, why wouldn't the government contract or defense shield be adequate for for uh, protection? Uh, th this is an area that, that skirts my expertise in terms yeah. of, of legal understanding. But as it has been explained to me, and I believe it's accurate, the, 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 the indemnification activities that uh, exist for many kinds of contractual procedures are really not anywhere near as mm -hmm. flexible or appropriate or useful as some of the liability kinds of, of, uh, of protections that exist. Um, I believe the recent example of, of how smallpox has been dealt with uh, is a very reasonable model for us to take forward. And if I may just expand on, on my answer for a moment to answer a question, not that you didn't address to me, but you did address earlier because I, I really feel it's worth some, some further discussion. Our feeling is that, that the liability uh, uh, protection should be afforded not just to the manufacturer. We, we think there's a very strong case for that, and I'm happy to, mm -hmm. to further define that. Yeah, but we that also agreement. believe that there should be some equitable, uh, uh, appropriate consideration of the people who are receiving the product, mm -hmm. and I would even add the the people who are delivering the product. That is, the healthcare providers, physicians, and so forth. The reason is, I think that we're operating. Anytime you have a product uh, considered, even approved by the Food and Drug Administration, there's a balance of what we know and what we don't know. At a certain point, the FDA and its scientists say, we know enough to say that this is relatively safe and relatively effective because there's nothing that's absolutely safe and absolutely effective. And we have confidence when there's a lot of information there. Our concern is that for some of these products, because of the difficulty of testing them, because of the fact that they may be in the midst of development, that, that balance will be shifted. And we won't know quite as much as we would like to. And there will be more unknowns about risks and benefits. So you think the manufacturer should be protected from liability to give the incentive to develop these products, but the public that's exposed to them that may have some uh, adverse effects should also be compensated? Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Dr. Edwards, I want to welcome you because you're from Thank you. UCLA, among other reasons. Yes. Uh, there was a report in yesterday's New England Journal of Medicine that a, a common bacteria is now highly resistant to uh, vancomycin, one of the most uh, powerful antibiotics in modern medicine. Do you believe that more research needs to be done to find alternative treatment for vancomycin-resistant bacteria? Absolutely. This is just a major a problem that we're facing every day in our hospitals. And in fact, I would like to give a, a very brief example that sort of summarizes a conundrum. In our institution, we recently had a patient who uh, was a 60-year-old <clears throat> brought in by her family, her uh, daughter and her grandchildren, and had severe asthma, and also had evidence of an infection that seemed to be mild a deliberate decision was made not to put the patient on vancomycin because that drug has become so valuable and there is so little in the background to uh, <coughs> uh, available to counteract a vancomycin resistant organism. Mm -hmm. So the patient was relatively stable at the time she came into the hospital, but she rapidly uh, decompensated and died, unfortunately. And at the time of her autopsy, a vanca, an organism that was multiply resistant to antimicrobials was recovered, but it was sensitive to vancomycin. And this example illustrates how 
we are faced with a situation now of trying to conserve the use of specifically that agent, but also others, because there's so very little in the uh, background for support for resistant organisms. And the, the, comp the situation is very complex and intricate, uh, and I think this example displays some of those intricacies of the kinds of decisions that are being made in hospitals all over the country now based on this resistance problem. Do you think there are national security implications of some uh, problems? Ab absolutely. Uh, the, the resistance issue is tied to some of the basic science of bioterrorism agents as well. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful to have on mm -hmm. the record. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the uh, panel. I want to thank the panel as well. It's been very helpful to us as we try to formulate uh, some uh, meaningful legislation over the next uh, a uh, few months. Anyone want to add anything before we go? If not, let me just again thank you. Um, I want to thank the staff for working on this hearing. Uh, we'll be following up on a SARS issue at a hearing scheduled for next Wednesday, April 9th at 10 a.m. We're going to keep the record open for two weeks. If you want to supplement your comments in any way, think of something you didn't say or respond, uh, please feel free to do that. Um, and the hearing's adjourned. Thank you. For more on the President's BioShield proposal, check our website, cspan.org. You'll see our green FYI box in the center of the homepage. That box has a link to the White House's official web area with more detail on the President's plan.